My name is Gail Whiteman. I'm a professor of sustainability at the University of Exeter, and I'm also the founder of a science communication not-for-profit called Arctic Base Camp. What I want to talk about today is um, uh, not the rainforest, but the Arctic and the subarctic, and really about how do we make sense of environmental risk coming from these regions. And I'm going to do that by, by telling um, uh, three stories. The first story is, is uh, starts a long time ago, nearly 26 years ago, almost exactly. Um, I moved to the subarctic to start my PhD in the most northern part of Canada uh, with the James Bay Cree. Uh, the Cree have lived there for thousands of years successfully, and I wanted to figure out what they were doing. Originally, I, I went to try to uh, take a look at the impact of development on this pristine area. And quickly what I learned was that the hunters and the trappers that lived there said that I had to move into the bush to actually really understand uh, the area. And so I did. So on November 11th, 1996, I actually moved into a bush camp which was about 600 square kilometers of wilderness. I was with a hunting family uh, one winter. Temperatures uh, at night were minus 50 degrees Celsius. During the day, they were minus 30. And on that very first day, I started on my first trip with a hunter and we went out in the ca canoe uh, uh, and we were going to get some gas. And on that day, I actually nearly died. Um, when we got to the top of a very large rapid, um, we started to walk and we started to do some of his basic tasks. And I was so inexperienced in this kind of ecosystem that I slipped and I fell down uh, some black ice on a rock face and into the very top of a rapid, hanging on to uh, um, rocks for my dear life. Um, I, of course, screamed. I don't remember that. Um, I don't remember making much sound, but luckily the hunter found me, ran, and eventually got me out of the water. At that point, I thought that we would go home. Um, I was cold. It was near freeze up, so I was going hypothermic. Uh, and actually what he did was he made me change, uh, and then he made me continue to do the tasks that we had set out to do that day. So we did a full day's work after that. And I couldn't believe it at the time. For me, we'd been in a highly dangerous, risky situation. And I just wanted to go back to the bush camp. I wanted to have a hot, hot cup of tea. And I wanted really to go home. And eventually we did get back in the boat and on we went and we did go home and we did have a hot cup of tea. And I realized that that would have been my second mistake to want to actually go home immediately because what he had known and I had not was not just that this landscape, which was beautiful, it was pristine in my mind, could be dangerous in a slip of a boot, but also it could be dangerous if you didn't understand what did hypothermia mean, and that the last thing you wanted to do was to get back into a boat, you actually needed to warm up and get your body temperature, your core temper up before you go actually into, into uh, onto the, the water again. Now, I spent two years living with the Cree, and they taught me many things. And in the 10 weeks I spent on that winter in a bush camp, it was clear that even in 1996, that there were things that were happening with the ice that were like nothing they had seen before. Now, the Cree had lived there for thousands of years. Uh, certainly, the hunters and the families that I lived with spent all of their time outside, uh, particularly during the winter. So they had minute and detailed understanding of that landscape but also they had historic understanding of the landscape and the fact that the ice was changing. And indeed, unfortunately, uh, while I was there, a hunter went through the ice in a place that was supposed to uh, be safe. It had historically always been safe at that part of the year uh, and it had gone through and was uh, found only at uh, the next spring when the ice thawed. That was my first experience with climate impacts. Uh, what they were seeing in EU Ashti, which is what the Cree called uh, uh, the land, was one of the early uh, manifestations of a changing climate. And they noticed it much faster than I would have done as a grad student because they understood how important it was. Now, the interesting thing to me about this story is not only was it a breathtaking experience and the Arctic is a, a compelling place, but it was that the local people 
understood the importance of their landscape and also understood that it was changing. They didn't necessarily know why, but they understood much faster than many of us at the time, 1996, understood it was. Now, fast forward 26 years, uh, current day. Well, the, the Cree are in the press again. The area that I did my PhD, although it's, it's had hydroelectric development, it's had forestry, it's had mining, is actually now under a, a, a campaign to defend it again. It is one of the most carbon dense areas in the world, and it holds twice as much carbon per hectare as the Amazon. And when the Cree start to use the language that of that uh, carbon uh, dense, uh, much more carbon than the Amazon, the rest of the world starts to listen a lot more than when they simply say it's important for our culture. So when we talk about risk coming from the Arctic and the subarctic, risk depends on where you are, depends on who you are, and depends on how you make sense of minute changes. I've spent my entire career since that time actually trying to identify and communicate these sorts of global risks uh, in these kinds of places. With the work that I do with Arctic Base Camp, we're a science communication um, organization. Uh, uh, what we try to do is we try to speak science to power, and we focus on the Arctic because the Arctic is rapidly changing. Now, of course, it's important to the people of the Arctic, but it also opens up shipping, so it's important to all kinds of people around the world. But the research and the data that, that I know that my science team knows is that what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay there but it's really hard to make sense of that when we're so far away. So take Greenland, for example. Put a, a picture of Greenland in your mind. It, uh, we just saw Frozen Planet 2, so we've got, got it well, well placed. It has to be one of the, if not the most beautiful places in the world. And even when you see it melting, it is still one of the most beautiful places in the world. And that's quite different than a forest that has been clear cut or wildfires that have ravaged an area or drought or flooding. When the Arctic is in crisis, it still looks beautiful and it still is very far away. And we're not really sure how it touches our lives uh, today as, as we know it. So we do know Greenland is melting. Uh, who doesn't? Uh, we've heard it's bad news for the polar bear. Is it bad news for us? Well, part of our science team at Arctic Base Camp has published research that shows that right now, even if we stop all emissions, all greenhouse ga gas emissions today, Greenland, the ice sheet, will still melt up to 3% of its volume. Now, again, the number three, if I say it, sounds kind of small. We know Greenland is kind of big. So where does that net out? Well, it's hard when we start to say it will be centimeters, 18 centimeters of sea level rise in the next 60, 70, 80 years. Again, those numbers could be big if it was immediate, but if over such a long period of time, seems small. But what if I showed you a bottle of water from Greenland, from the ice sheet? And here, actually, I've got one because we did this. We, we went to Greenland and we bottled water from one of the melting uh, glaciers. So here it is. It's about the size of a wine bottle. And if I said to you how many of these bottles, so these ones right here, imagine a wine bottle, are melting a second, what would you say? So just in your mind as your audience here, how many bottles a second are you melting? I've asked CEOs this, I've asked uh, um, uh, politicians this, I've asked the general public. Very rarely do they get the number I'm about to tell you. Well, these aren't wine bottles, these are glacier melt bottles, but based on a decade average of data, 17 million of these bottles are melting a second. 17 million every second based on a decade average. So that's a ton of water. And where's it going? Well, it's going into sea level rise, of course. That's where it's going. But it's not just Greenland. If we know the Arctic in general, it's warming four times faster than the rest of the planet. If we look at the ice, that's the, the, the sea ice, the summer sea ice, sure it melts every year and then it freezes again in the winter. But 75% of the volume of that ice, that sea ice, has disappeared, has melted, is not coming back in the winter. And if we look at the sea ice as our sort of insurance policy against runaway climate change, we've lost 75% of that. On top of that, we know that the Greenland, uh, uh, sorry, not Greenland, but the Arctic uh, land itself is thawing, permafrost is releasing, and the Arctic itself is getting greener. So there's less white, there's more green, there's more heat going in. So we can say that we know that the Arctic is in crisis. 
At the same time, when I'm talking to world leaders or I'm talking to politicians or I'm talking to business executives, unless I bring it home to them, those Arctic risks don't really mean very much. So my final story here is one I want to show you, uh, tell you about uh, um, the UN meetings, both in Glasgow uh, last year and in Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt this year. What we try to do with Arctic Base Camp is try to bring the Arctic into those meetings. In Glasgow, we actually brought a Greenland iceberg to Glasgow. We let it melt during the COP. Um, uh, we shipped it in. We carbon offset uh, its emissions. That's a problem. It's not really perfect, but it was something that we did that we felt we had to bring some of the Arctic right there. The interesting thing is that as delegates and as people attending the conference walked past it day on day out, they kept saying to us, hey, couldn't you put a tarp on it? Couldn't you somehow protect it from that Glaswegian rain? And we said, no, this iceberg is melting here and a lot more bergs are melting up in the actual Arctic. So the point is, is that it seems far away, but when we bring things prox into proximity, people start to understand them in a way that they didn't before. Now, the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. It affects everything that we do. It affects extreme weather, um, threats to food and water security, uh, sea level rise, supply chain disruption, you name it, the Arctic has its hand in it. If we lose the snow and ice, all that white, we will amplify climate change by 25 to 40 percent globally. So it's not uh, just something that happens far away and is bad news for the polar bear. So my final story here is something that we are doing for Sharm el Sheikh, because I could stay as just Professor Doom and Gloom, and some days I am like that. But what we wanted to do this time was just do um, some way that we could talk about the global risks of Arctic change in a way that could reach new audiences, those that were not necessarily paying attention to climate change, not necessarily paying attention to what was happening in Sharm el Sheikh. So we worked with one of our board members, uh, the U.S. actor, Rain Wilson, on this call. Some of you may know him as uh, a Dwight Shute from the American version of The Office. It's a U.K. audience, so you're probably more familiar with the Ricky Gervais version. But Rain is on our board, and he has been um, a tireless supporter of trying to help us figure out how to communicate Arctic risk um, in ways that actual normal people that are not interested in climate change can do so. So what we did uh, uh, this time is we convinced uh, Rain, so Rain Wilson is his name, to change his name last wow. Thursday. I don't know if you saw it on Sky or The Guardian, but certainly throughout the U.S., it completely went viral. Rain Wilson changed his name to Rainfall um, uh, Heat Wave Extreme Winter Wilson and explained to people that they, too, could change their name to an Arctic risk name. We set up an online tool on one of our, our things, and indeed I am Gail Uncontrollable Wildfire Whiteman, as opposed to my normal name of just Gail Whiteman. Now, is that too trite? Is that too um, simplistic? I don't know, the jury is out. What I have seen though, is that so many more people have engaged with this issue, are aware of the Arctic and global risk, and then they were in the past. We've had 100,000 names generated on our online tool, and we've had 500 media stories with a reach of, I don't know, a potential reach of, of millions and millions and millions. And my question, I suppose, that I ask myself and my team is that if we're going to talk about Arctic risk and communicate that, we have to also think about the opportunities to talk in a way that scientists don't normally talk to. Thank you.